So let me review just a couple of the uh, things that we're finding for the second time. This one's been in the news quite a bit, and some of you have heard about it. It's the Antikythera device. I won't go into detail on it, but it was found in a, a Greek shipwreck in the Aegean Sea that unquestionably dates to about 100 BC. And it just sat in the museum there for a long time, and they thought it was an anchor until somebody had knocked it over, and they realized that it had all this uh, Greek writing and gears inside. As a matter of fact, 32 precision gears. And what's weird about it is that uh, geared devices, particularly precision gears, were not developed until the great clock-making era, which is about 12, 1300 AD, 1400 AD, something like that. And likewise, uh, the battery was invented by Volta in the year 1704, I think it was. And the battery he invented was actually cruder than this one, which they found in the ruins of Babylon that dates uh, at least 2,000 years old. And dentistry is something I think uh, we all thought, you know, if we had a, a cavity uh, just a couple hundred years ago, we'd go down to the barber, they'd give us some whiskey, and they'd yank that thing out. Well, they found these skulls in Pakistan last summer, 13 skulls that have their rear molars neatly drilled. And they took this to modern-day dentists who said, hey, that's really good work. You know, they were able to <laughs> drill the, uh, the holes there without cracking the enamel and that sort of thing. And the thing on the left is a, an anthropologist's view of how they might have done it. And the problem is you can't get a, anything to turn on a rear molar quite like that. So it's about 8,000 years out of context. And same thing with these trepanation devices. These, these are not all new discoveries, but they're discoveries that are just way out of line with our, our current notions of history. Uh, of course, one notion is brain uh, surgery didn't come along until fairly recently. And here they found these uh, skulls, again, Mesopotamia area, have these neatly uh, uh, circular little scars on a few skulls that date back at least 5,000 years. They fit these, uh, some of these devices that they found, and they're, they've healed. And so they were doing something that uh, we thought was pretty impossible for a hunter-gatherer. And I know others have mentioned uh, this book, but where these anomalous artifacts do not make sense in the current paradigm of history, this linear paradigm where anything that became much, must be more primitive, they do make sense with the ancient paradigm or the ancient view of history, which is that it's, it's cyclical, meaning that we have these alternating dark and golden ages. And it was Giorgio de Santiana and his partner, Hertha von Deschen, who documented uh, these 200 plus myths, 30 cultures, most of them not in touch with each other, and yet they all came to the same understanding. And uh, as mentioned uh, in my opening comments, this was the, the dominant theory up until the uh, Darwinian paradigm. And most of those cultures talked about uh, how this cycle tied to a change in the heavens. Now, they didn't always call it procession or the procession equinox, but they said the motion of the heavens or the changing stars, or sometimes they related particular uh, times to, uh, to different constellations, such as uh, the Mithraic culture, where you slay the bull in Taurus, and that opens the age for Aries and things like that. And so the celestial clock, then, is, uh, is really the, the 12 constellations. Those are the, the numbers on the clock, if you will. The, the equinox moves just like a big hour hand, and you have the, uh, the spring equinox, vernal, and your fall equinox, the autumnal equinox. And that tells you what uh, sign you're in. And so going by the spring equinox, we're in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, just leaving Pisces. Um, but actually, you find a lot of writings, particularly uh, Vedic culture, where they, they use the autumnal equinox. Um, and so they would say, uh, 
no, we're not in a golden age right now. We're actually just came out of the dark ages and we're heading on the way up. So that's uh, how they interpret it. And you know, some other cultures didn't even use equinox at all. They used the solstice as, as a marker. But solstice would just go uh, this way on it. And if you had to uh, put stars on here, the Milky Way would be sort of a, a C curve uh, through the side there. Now, of course, the, uh, the equinox changes uh, relative to the stars uh, due to precession. And the current theory of precession was talked about briefly, and that is that the, the Earth is slightly oblate, and because it's oblate, a little fat around the sides, uh, and the moon is slightly off-center from the equator, then the moon would uh, slowly tug the Earth. So in the current uh, precession equations, the moon is about 97% of the force. And uh, we do see a signature of the moon on the Earth, uh, which exactly matches its uh, up and down uh, motion around the equator, uh, but that shows up as, uh, as mutation. And a lot of people lump together mutation and precession. And, and uh, basically what we find with, that's wrong with the current model is when you look at the uh, motion of the equinox or the axis, Earth's axis, if you will, relative to the distant stars, you do see that the Earth changes orientation by about 50 arc seconds per year relative to very distant stars. And scientists now measure relative to not just distant stars, but to quasars. They're uh, you know, radio stars outside, the, uh, outside our own galaxy. They want to use a point as far away as possible because even if it moves around a little bit, it, it's so far off on, on the distance that uh, you don't see those movements from us. And so I understand why they use such distant points. But what we did was we looked also, uh, understanding the Vedic notion that precession might have a different cause, we looked at, well, what does the Earth do relative to things within the solar system, relative to the moon, relative to the sun, and relative to Venus? Those, those are the three things we tested against. And it turns out the, we can find no evidence that the equinox moves or the axis wobbles relative to anything within the solar system. But clearly it moves relative to things outside the solar system by roughly 50 arc seconds a year, which at that rate it takes 26,000 years or so to, to make one complete circuit. And so this is, it's almost like a paradox. How could it not be moving relative to things in the solar system and yet move to things outside the solar system. And so there, there's another way you can explain it, and that is, is this binary model, uh, meaning if our sun has a partner, like most stars do, uh, they just did a survey of the closest 60 stars, and 37 of those are, are binary or, or multiple star systems, so a little over 60%. And the NASA Chandra website says that uh, it's maybe over 80% because they now think that a lot of stars have brown dwarf companions. So most stars out there do have companions. And if indeed we are going around another star, as some of these uh, ancient cultures hint at, which we'll talk about in a minute, then uh, you can produce the same observable of precession, the stars moving across the sky, by our our, our star, the sun, slowly curving through space, going around another star, and then you get back to the equinox each year, and it reorients you relative to the 12 constellations. So uh, as Graham mentioned and others, you know, regardless of the cause of precession, um, the ancients seemed to be uh, tracking this and held, uh, held this whole phenomena in very high regard, which is quite unusual because it's such a tiny motion, one degree in 72 years, it's, it's hard to observe. And